Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Code Emporium where we're going to continue our discussion about constructing the transformer neural network architecture with code and also describing some cool theory along the way. So for this video, we're gonna be talking about the positional encoding piece. And so I'm gonna start this video by a transformer neural network architecture overview with an example of how all these pieces fit together. Then I'm gonna actually do a deep dive of this initial section over here and give you like the impetus of exactly why we use positional encoding and what it entails. And then we'll actually walk through some code with PyTorch. So let's get to it. So in the transformer neural network architecture, it's a sequence to sequence model where sequences can be a ordered set of tokens. In this case, sentences can be an ordered set of words. So let's say that we want to translate from the English sentence to a Kannada sentence. Kannada is a regional language in South India. I've described this before in my videos, but I'm just gonna do it again because it's pretty fun. So let's translate the sentence, my name is Ajay. The input is passed in simultaneously into the encoder, and then we get the output also simultaneously as a set of four vectors. These would, for now, be word vectors where every vector represents a word, but in the actual implementation of transformers and other language models, these are typically word pieces like byte pair encodings. So they would split words into sub words in order to make sure that the entire vocabulary doesn't become too large. Now we're gonna be passing all of these into the decoder where we now have an initial start token just to start the generation process. And we'll be generating the translation one word at a time. In this case, we're translating to Kannada and the first word translation of this would be Nanna, which means basically my. We then take that word as the input for the next generated word, which is Hesaru. This basically means name in Kannada. We then take that as input for the next timestamp and we generate the final word, which is a J. And that's my name. And so this is just a very brief overview of how transformers work, but we're gonna be paying more attention now to this part. So let's actually walk through exactly how the initial part of the transformer neural network architecture works so that it kind of motivates positional encodings better. So first we have the sentence that we want to input in English that is my name is a J. Now, typically the way that transformers and all these machine learning models work is that they understand numbers, they understand vectors, but they don't understand exactly, you know, English words. And so what we would do is in order to make sure that we always pass in a fixed length matrix, we would pad the rest of all the words that are not present, present or not, with just like a dummy character or dummy sequence input. And this would just be the maximum number of words that is allowed into the transformer. Each of these words is then just one hot encoded. Vocab size is the number of words in our dictionary. That is the number of possible words that can be used as an input. We now pass this into a feed forward layer where each of these vectors is going to be mapped to a 512 dimensional vector. And the parameters here are learnable via backpropagation. And the number of parameters would be the vocabulary size times 512 parameters to learn. Now the output of this would just be a set of 512 dimensional vectors, one for each input in the sequence. And it's to this that we're going to add some positional encoding, which is of the same size. And on doing so, we're now going to get another set of word vectors of the same 512 dimensions. Now for each word vector, we wanna generate a query, a key, and a value vector, all of 512 dimensions each. And so we would pass each vector into, well, this query key and value set of weights, which will map one input vector to the output either query vector. This will map it to the key vector and this will map it to the value vector. And we do this for every single word. And so the number of total vectors here would be three times the maximum sequence length because it's three for every word. Note here that these green transformations are basically like learnable parameters. In this case, it'd be 512 times 512 learnable parameters for each of these. Now it's from this point that we could probably split each of these vectors into multiple heads and perform multi-headed attention. But I think I've explained some of this concept in another video called multi-head attention for transformers. So please do check that out for more information there. 
However, for now, I kind of want to just focus more on this positional encoding. And I hope that this flow overall kind of just illustrates exactly where positional encoding fits in and how it fits in. So this is the formulation for computing positional encoding in the transformer. Now, for this is actually just to compute it for every single element of this matrix that we mentioned before. In this case, we have pos, which is the position of the word in the sequence. I is the index of the dimension. And D model is the dimension length, which we have taken to be 512. So a big question here is why exactly did we formulate positional embedding in this way? The first reason is periodicity. Sine and cosine functions are periodic functions, so they will repeat after some point of time. What this means is that let's say that we want to look at this positional encoding and we're looking at it for this specific word, that is the third word. Let's say that at some point we're going to compute the attention matrix and try to determine how much attention this word should pay to all other words. Now during this phase, because of periodicity, this word is going to be able to pay attention to, let's say, five words after it, and then 10 words after it, and then 15 words after it in a much more tractable way. Now, the second reason is constrained values. Sine and cosine will constrain the values to be between positive one and negative one. But without that, these values, at least in the positive direction, are not bounded. And so what this would mean is that like positional encoding for this vector might be smaller than this next vector, which will be smaller than this next vector and so on. And during the time that we compute the actual attention matrices, you'll notice that the, the vector here is not going to be able to attend to vectors that are very far away from it. And so it will not be able to derive any context from them. The last reason is that it's easy to extrapolate for long sequences. So this here is just going to be a very deterministic formula that's very easy to compute. And even if we haven't seen certain sequence lengths in our training set, we'll always be able to interpret them in our test set. And so because of easy extrapolation, it's used. Now that we got that theory out of the way, let's walk through some PyTorch code to create some positional encodings. So we'll start by importing torch, and then we define a max sequence length. This is the maximum number of words that can be passed into our transformer simultaneously. So in my case, the sequence length was four because it was my name is a J, but I'm defining the max length as 10. In reality, this would be in the thousands. D model is going to be the dimension of the embeddings. It's typically 512, but for illustrative purposes, I just use six. Now this top two is exactly the same formulation that I used to show positional encodings, but honestly, I'm going to rewrite it as just these two formulations so that it becomes easier to see and also easier to program, but they remain the same thing. Let's now start by coding out this denominator for when I is even. So for this, I would just use a range just to get a set of values between zero and D model. That's zero to six, skipping two. So it's zero, two, and four. And so we can now compute the denominator over here by taking 10 to the power of all of these values that we get divided by D model. And that's exactly what I do here. That's 10,000 to the power of everything that we just received here divided by D model. And so we get a set of values here. We now do the same thing for the odd dimensions. So we compute the odd dimensions where it's from one to six, skipping two. And so we get one, three, and five. And then performing the same operation right here, performing the same operation, we get these numbers. Now what you'll notice here is that the, the vectors that we got for the even denominator, that is for this, and the vector that we got for this denominator are exactly the same. And this kind of makes sense. You'll notice that the odd indices are one more than the even indices. And in the formulation, we always subtract one from the odd indices. So they effectively just became the same thing. And so instead of using an odd denominator and even denominator, I just am going to use one called denominator and that'll be used for both cases. Now let's just determine every single position for the sequence. So we can define every position by just taking all the values from one to 10, and then we'll reshape it to be a two dimensional matrix with the second dimension as one. And you'll get this two dimensional matrix here, one for every word. 
Now we want to divide every position with the denominator value that we computed earlier. And for even cases, we're going to take sine. And for odd instances, we're going to take the cosine. And so this is going to lead to two 10 cross three dimensional vectors. So this is for even positions. And then we have the same exact thing for odd positions. Now what we want though, is to interleave these two matrices. So for example, for the even position, we want this to be the first index, and then we want this to be the second index, and then the third index, and then the fourth index, but starting at zero. So it'll be the zeroth index, first index, second index, third index, and so on. In order to do that, I basically stack them together while on the second dimension so that the two that we need to stack on top of each other are right next to each other. This will give us a 10 cross three cross two tensor and we just flatten it. And effectively, we're going to be getting that interleavement here too. And so for our first word, this will be the positional encoding. For the second word, it's this one. For the third word, it's here, and so on. Now I've put together everything that we just talked about into this little cute class here so that it's reusable. And it has the exact same instances of everything that we just discussed. And we can now just make some calls to the positional encoding, passing the elements into the constructor. And then we just generate the forward pass, which will give us the exact same positional encoding matrix. So I hope this all made sense. The code will be available on GitHub down in the description below. Also, if you do think I deserve it, please consider giving me a like and also subscribe for more content. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.